report. So they hauled him off to boot camp. Soon the other recruits gave up the rules of being deaf, but my grandfather, of course, was unable to follow instructions. It became apparent he was in fact deaf, so they sent him home. In, 18, in April 1915, Canadians fought in the Second Battle of Ypres, where they were subjected to the Germans' first use of chlorine gas. Phosgene, a choking agent, and mustard gas, which affects infections, inflicts painful burns on the skin, were among the chemicals used later. Right. This picture shows Canadian soldiers wearing improvised or self-made mass detection equipment. So they didn't have they weren't issued that. They made it themselves to protect themselves. Now this shows later army issue equipment. Notice the body protection against mustard gas it was all the way down to the fingertips. I think Dr. Browning has the museum has an example of this somewhere. Battle of Vinny Ridge. That's the next major battle. Um, this shows a map of France, and in red is a dot showing Vinny Ridge, where I'm going to describe a battle where Canadians were involved. Many historians and writers consider the Canadian victory at Vinny a defining moment for Canada, when the country emerged from under the shadow of Britain and felt capable of greatness. Previous attacks on the ridge by the British and other allies had proven unsuccessful. The Battle of Indian Ridge proved to be a great success, but only came at a heavy cost. The 100,000 Canadians who fought there suffered more than 10,600 casualties, nearly 3,600 of which were fatal. Um, a fellow I talked with Canada, uh, lost his grandfather at the Vinnie Ridge. Big six. Ah. This map, the map shows the rapid advance of four divisions of Canadian soldiers west of the French town of Vinnie. Vinnie's shown over there on the... This Vinnie. All right. And uh, in one day, the troops advanced across the ridge from the solid black line over here, where they were the day before, all the way in one day to the dotted line just close to Vimy, at the tip of the ridge, in one day. These are the four divisions. It was almost all Canadians. This pic picture shows Canadians in a bunker on the Western Front, underground. This shows troops leaving their trenches to attack. You see the Canadian helmets. This picture shows Canadian troops riding on trucks. And this picture shows what the Canadians riding on a tank. Now, tanks were originally called land ships, not tanks. But to keep German spies in Britain from knowing their true military purpose, they were described as steel water tanks. And that's where the name tank comes from. This shows more troops on the tank, I think. There's more troops. There's that, that 401 tank. This slide shows Canadian artillery. Look at the size of those guns. Uh, next. This slide, slide shows rough looking Canadians walking through the mud. There's a lot of mud in there. Uh, in the front. This shows soldiers carrying a wounded soldier through the mud. It's almost waist high and some sort of knee high anyway. Uh, this shows Canadian troops marching in London. So you can see a body and then Canadian troops in London. And this shows, picture shows uh, mobile armor. The war ended with the armistice going into effect at 11 a.m. on November 11, 1918. Canada, Canada does not have Memorial Day. 
but annually commemorates the, his participation in both world wars on Remembrance Day, which is our Veterans Day here, on November 11th at 11 a.m. on the date and time in the armistice and in World War I to sign. Are these grown in Flanders Steel Belgium where many names are, are buried? As students in school, we always wore a poppy around Remembrance Day, and many Canadians still wear them. I know you have a poppy on the wall over there. There it is. Six, seven, sheet. Unless you still know. This slide shows a young Canadian boy saluting the grave of Canadians killed in the Great War, which, as I mentioned, was the original name of World War I. Now this is prepared, something we prepared later on. Uh, this is about John. Uh, uh, I'd like to read a poem entitled In Flanders Fields. This is about John McKay, the author. It was written by John McCray, who was a Canadian poet, author, artist, physician, and soldier. He was from the city of Guelph which is about 25 miles from Kitchener, where I live. He was inspired to write it when mourning the death of a friend killed in the war. And the slide sort of summarizes that. So I'm going to read Flanders Field to you. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow. The king of crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks, still gravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow. Love and were loved. And now we lie in the Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If he break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Between the wars, so much for World War I, Canada suffered from the Great Depression also, but only one bank failed, and that was because of fraud. This, the rest were too large to fail out and had many branches throughout the country. There was never a prohibition on alcohol. That was something you had here in the States. World War II. Canada, of its own free will, entered the war on September 10, 1939, following Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland, and because it then realized that Nazi Germany threatened the very existence of Western civilization. The United States waited an additional two years and three months to declare war, which it did, following the Japanese attack, Pearl Harbor attack on December 7, 1941. Still going again. World War II participation. We added this slide later. Let's see. Here. Uh, 11 million people lived in Canada. It had an army of 500,000 troops. Uh, most of the troops were in Europe. It represents 3% of American troops in World War II. That's World War II now. Yes, that's right. 3% uh, of American troops in World War II. Uh, 45,000 Canadians died. That's 9% of total troops. Um, you can see that very well. Uh, the United States had a population of 133 million, uh, and U.S. troops in World War II numbered 16 million. Amazing. 16 million troops of American troops in World War II. U.S. deaths were 407,000, which is 2.5% of total troops. British population in World War II was 41 million. British troops in World War II numbered 2,900,000, and British military deaths were 384,000, or 13% of troops, of the troops. This, oh, let's hang on a second. Hmm, there, where did the back of the 
Oh, the king's victory, you're right. I'll be with the sense here. When the war situation became desperate for Britain in 1940, in late 1940 and through early 1941, America wanted to help with war plans, but was restricted because it was officially neutral. It was illegal for military planes to be flown from the U.S. to Britain. So to circumvent the U.S. Neutrality Act, planes were flown to the Canadian border, drained of fuel, then were dragged across by horse or truck by Canadians. Once inside the Canadian border, the aircraft were refueled and flown to the nearest Canadian airport from where they would be shipped to Britain. This picture shows planes being dragged across the U.S. Canada border by a truck. I think it is. You can see the truck to the border line in the middle. That's that's the border over there. And they just keep it going. No, no, no. Okay, all right. Next picture. Uh, that's a summary of what I just said. Um, this picture shows a bomber, which may be a Lancaster bomber, and Canadian troops underneath it. Later, in the U.S., the Land Lease Act was passed in the U.S. on March 11, 1941. It set up a system that would allow the United States to lend or lease war supplies, as well as food, oil, and oil is any other any nation being vital to the defense of the United States. So there was no longer any need to drag military equipment across the border after March the 11th, 1941. Ah, this picture is of the wartime leaders at a meeting in Quebec City. From left to right, we have Prime Minister uh, Mackenzie King of Canada. Oops. Uh, Franklin FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt of the United States. Whoops, I did it again. That's a little tricky this thing. I've got a small finger and there's a little problem. Yes, it is. Yes, the Prime Minister of uh, Richard Churchill. This is the next one, Prime Minister of Britain. Uh, hang on a second. Right. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt of the United States. Um, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. And what appears to be, I thought it was a French general, but I think that they, they adjusted it, and I think it may have been the Governor General of Canada, who was a figurehead, supposed to rule Canada by permission from the Queen, but the King. But uh, we're not, I'm not sure of his status, that last guy there. And it was in Quebec City, that's where this took place. All right. This picture, the Royal Canadian, oh, the Royal Canadian, hang on a second. The Royal Canadian Navy, which started from scratch in 1939, was firstly no ships, grew to 700 ships and 95,000 men, making it the world's third largest navy by the end of the war. This force, too, was in the fight from almost the beginning. It participated in the daring rescue at Dunkirk, we call the evacuation of Allied troops in 1940. And it took over more and more of the Allied combat work across the North Atlantic, half of it by 1943, and most of it by 1944. The convoys were in good part made up of non-military merchant marine ships used to transport um, people, raw materials, and manufacturing goods, including weapons and ammunition. My mother's first cousin was with the the Merchant Marine, and unfortunately he died when the ship was sunk in the Atlantic. The Canadian Army numbered 1944 about a half a million men, six fifths of whom had volunteered. Rationing. Rationing was in effect in Canada towards the end of World War I and during World War II, beginning in January 1942, making it hard to obtain gasoline, sugar, meat, butter, eggs, and other food. These items were restricted and were needed to help feed the men fighting overseas. This 
poster, which was made before rationing, actually before rationing, encourages Canadians not to hoard. It shows a silhouette of a policeman prepared to arrest or fine hoarders. As I'm sure you, you can recall, hoarding became a problem here in Indiana in the American supermarkets beginning March 2020 due to the COVID pandemic. You recall the empty shelves? The hoarding is a real thing. People got creative to stretch their rations uh, by planting what were called um, victory gardens. Gardening became a new trend in cities and farms, including community gardens. Interest in hunting and fishing increased to stress the meat allocation. That is the thing of food rationing. Food rationing, there it is. Hoarding, victory garden, created. Right, I just mentioned that. Uh, let's see. Scrap collection. This poster encourages Canadians to collect various materials for the war effort, including metal, rubber, and glass. My mom remembers getting involved in the collection. This poster encourages women to join the CWAC, the Canadian Women's Army Corps. Women free men up for combat by being mechanics, cooks, secretaries, etc. It says in part, you need now to free a man to fight. Why sit at home in perfect ease, bring the Nazis to their knees. Okay. Next. Um, this poster is an ad for women to join the Canadian Air Force, RCAF. Okay. The yeah. app is almost exclusively Canadian operation. Operation Jubilee, or the Diet Ray, occurred on August 19, 1942. It was an Allied amphibious assault on the German occupied port of Diet. You can see it on the map there. It's just to the east of, uh, whoops, let me go again. Just to the east of, uh, there's Normandy and there's Diet. The German occupied port of Diet in northern France. Over 6,000. 50 infantry, predominantly Canadian, they were all Canadians, supported by a regiment of tanks, were put ashore from a naval force operating uh, under the protection of the Royal Air Force fighters. The port was to be captured and held for a short period to test, this is way back in 1942, to test the feasibility of a landing and to gather intelligence. German coastal defenses Port structures and important buildings were to be demolished. This raid was intended to boost Allied morale, demonstrate the commitment of the United Kingdom to reopen the Western Front and support the secret the Soviet Union, which was fighting on the Eastern Front. It had its hands full at that time. The raid was a total disaster. Let's see what we have over here. Yeah, sort of the same stuff, 100. Um, within, within, I'll leave it out of here, it's the same thing. Within 10 hours, about 3,600 of the approximately 6,000 Canadian men who landed had been killed, wounded, or became prisoners of war. That's about 60%. The Luftwaffe made a maximum effort against the landing as the RAF had expected. And the RAF, that's the Royal Air Force, lost 106 aircraft. At least 32 to the anti aircraft fire or from accidents, against 48 German losses. The Royal Navy lost 33 landing craft and a destroyer. This pic shows Canadian troops. Whoops, skip this slide. Uh, this is a. Hang on a second. Let's see here. Pick the intake if you are going to pick. This is a picture of the, the landing of the epic, the damaged equipment, damaged tanks and other things, Canadian equipment on the beach. Uh, the picture shows, this picture shows Canadian troops were marching as prisoners of war in Dieppe. You can see the German soldier on the, the left there, 
a los creyentes. Canadians fought in Sicily and Italy, but their main military effort was alongside American and British troops in June 1944, with the landing on the beaches of Normandy, with the fight continuing through France and into Germany. This map is DD map. The Royal Canadian Navy provided 109 vessels and 10,000 sailors as its contribution to the massive armada of 7,000 Allied vessels which went to sea on D-Day. Of the nearly 150,000 Allied troops who landed or parachuted and entered the invasion area, 14,000 were Canadians. The objective of the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division on D-Day was to cut an important road, seize the Carpet K Airport west of Pond, and form a line between the two British beaches on the flank. Canadian soldiers landed at Juno Beach on the outskirts of Bernier. 14,000 Canadians stormed onto the beach throughout the day. The fact that many of them had never seen combat did not hinder their performance. For by the end of the day, Canadian troops were farther inland than any of the British and American elements. And you can see the Canadian, the Canadian, the Canadian flags, it wasn't the flag then, but that's Juno Beach. There's the British to the left and right, and American, American troops further to the, uh, to the west. That's the Canadian flag troops. Uh, this diagram shows the landing of Maine. You already saw that, I think. It shows troops, Canadian landing their crafts at Normandy. There's some more um, Canadian troops disembarking. Let's see, we have 14,000, like I mentioned this, or 340 killed on the day, 547 wounded, 47 prisoners. And the rest of what I just described. Uh, this picture shows a Canadian playing the bagpipes surrounded by fellow soldiers on a ship headed for the Normandy invasion. Shows, this shows troops of water transport. To ensure that D-Day would succeed, as they mentioned, 340 Canadians had given their lives, 574 had been wounded, and 47 had taken prisoner. My first cousin's uncle was a tank commander in Canada. And the Army wanted him to continue training the tank crews in Canada. But he wanted to fight in Europe. So he went over and was killed in this tank in France. Canadian forces uh, made a major contribution to the liberation of the Netherlands, big time. The first Canadian Corps was responsible for the liberation of major cities like Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and The Hague, as well as numerous villages, towns and farms in the heavily populated country. Canadian units were out in Hong Kong when the Japanese attacked it on Pearl Harbor Day, and the Canadian declaration of war against Japan was made even before our declaration of war. So Canada actually went to war against Japan the day before we declared Congress declared war here. A battalion of Canadian troops took part in the landing on Crisca, Crisca and, and the Aleutian Islands. Japanese held in a couple of islands in, in the Aleutians for a while. Canadian squadrons flew in the air, mostly in South Asia. Around 1969, I was hitchhiking across Canada and got a lift on the North Shore of Edge Security. The driver told me that during World War II, the nearby area known as Nays, now known as Nays Provincial Park, was referred to as Nays Camp 100. Instead of campers, it mainly held high-ranking German prisoners of war, POWs. The camp operated from 1941 to 1946. It was very remote, with no highway, and so it was only accessible by railroad and boat. There had been a couple of escapees, but the severe weather, winter weather, and mosquitoes and black flies in the warmer months, drove them back to the camp. So they, didn't, they may have escaped briefly, but they, they went back. 
One escapee hid out in a nearby town for the duration of the war because he spoke English. He gave himself up at the end of the war, the war and I was told he spent a little time in jail before being released. The prisoners at Nace Camp Hunter were sent back to Germany in March 1946, over many emigrated back to Canada. Beginning in 1942, 21, that has happened in the States too, of course, beginning in 1942, 21,000 Japanese Canadians living in British Columbia, whoops, uh, the Russian most province in Canada, living in British Columbia, uh, and which has a, a, a coastline, were forcibly relocated and incarcerated. There's 21,000 Japanese Canadians. This slide shows Canadian troops patrolling the perimeter of a POW camp, a German POW camp in the province of Alberta. And it's winter, which it is for a long time there. World War II in Europe ended on May 7, 1945. Officially, May 8, because the Russians wanted to attend the signing. Okay, I'm going to move just briefly to the other wars that they had since World War II, if you don't mind. The Korean War. I notice you'll have some displays here in the museum. With nearly 30,000 boots on the ground in Korea, Canada fought in several key battles and engagements, providing provided naval and aerial support to the UN, and suffered hundreds of combat casualties, including 516 deaths. Vietnam. Canada did not officially participate in the Vietnam War. Privately, some Canadians did contribute and went overseas to the war effort, and Canadian corporations sold war material to the U.S. government. After the war ended, he contributed to peacekeeping forces in 1973 to help enforce the Paris Peace Accords. Some 30,000 to 40,000 American reserves and draft resistors fled to Canada during the war. Desert Storm. Canada's biggest contribution of, during uh, Operation Desert Storm came in the air with CF-18 squadrons and 500 personnel operating out of the Canada Bay Drive bases in Qatar. As the conflict intensified, Canadian jets fought in Iraq and land and sea targets. Afghanistan. More than 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces members served in Afghanistan. 40,000 as part of the NATO International Security Assistance Force from 2001-2014, making this the largest Canadian military deployment since the Second World War. Now, I was going to stop there, but I, I don't know if you're interested in other some other little Canadian facts. You seem tired of my, of my voice? Yeah, a little bit. Good boy, a little more. All right. Uh, basketball, which I'm sure you all enjoy. I have you know it was invented by a Canadian American like me. James Naismith, in 1891, in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, what else? Canadian versus American football. Well, uh, there's some differences. Uh, I've been watching. You get, how many of you get uh, CBS Sports? How many get CBS Sports? Not too many people? Okay, so they have to they have Canadian football games. I watch them on the weekends. And <laughs> I like American football. I love the NFL. But there's some interesting differences. Uh, Canadian football has is a, is a smarter field. It's 10 yards longer and 12 yards wider. It has 12 men instead of, instead of 11. It has three downs instead of four downs. Um, the end zone, both posts are on the goal line. So it's easier to kick a field goal when you're anywhere in the other in the opposing team's territory. The end zone is 20 yards deep instead of 10 yards. Which is, which is good if you're trying to run in the red zone, one score. You have lots of room for your receivers to run around the end zone. A lot of passing because the field is so large. There's no fair catch, no fair catches. So you catch the ball and you're given five yards, you are given five yards to run. And uh, a lot of the runs are quite significant because the field is so small, so large, it's easy to get around the opponent. Uh, that's about it. I have the Canadian National Anthem. Uh, all right, uh, let's see what else. Canada's population just past 40 million. The U.S. population is about 336. You want to know about Canadian political parties? No? Sure? All right. 
Canada, unlike the after parties, they have four. We have the liberals who are ruling, ruling the country right now. They are likely Democrats, liberals, maybe a little further left. They you have the conservatives, which are likely with our Republicans, but are a little to the left of them. Then you have a, a party called the NDP, the New Democratic Party. It's socialists, like some of the countries and governments of some of the countries in, in, uh, in Europe, socialists. And uh, they were actually responsible for getting Medicare in Canada way back in 1970. And uh, uh, finally, we have the Parti Québécois, which is a French separatist party. The only the people are only elected in Quebec, which is a French province. And their goal is to bring Canada, Canada up so Quebec leaves. Well, that's about it. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, we're going to pull the microphones around for people to ask. Turn the lights on if you can. Uh, a couple of announcements before you get your questions ready. Raise your hand if you got a question. Um, that's the other way. Okay. Uh, we have uh, the National Guard that's going to show up at the airport at 1 o'clock. They've been on by Iraq for the last year. Um, we had, uh, I think, three of them were lost back in 2006, which was a big tragedy. But I don't think we lost any of these this time. It's in the paper today. There's no special ceremony, but when you leave here, you can drive by there and there's parking space going up and giving them a tribute because they're the real warriors for keeping their freedom here. Um, second announcement there's a little, there's a lot of wood out in front, right by the gate, habitat of Evansville, and we have Don Gillis over here, uh, and a guy named Yeager. He isn't Chuck Yeager, but he's a relative, I think. Uh, they're going to build a little building there for us. It's going to help with the storage, but also be the gatehouse for a big function. So that's Habitat has done a lot of work. These guys are out here two days this week. They're going to be out there this week. So next time you come out there, there'll be a, a box there. It's a pretty good sized box. And uh, if you want to be one of the monkeys in the box, you can join me. Okay, I don't see questions right now. If you don't have any questions, I've got several for Erwin, uh, thank you for all that information, Erwin. Um, th these Canadians, you, you did real well, Erwin. I could understand you. Uh, My accent is too bad, yeah. Your English is very good, and that being a teacher up there. Uh, but that, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the war at deep, 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 yeah. So that's in 42, and they just got slaughtered. But it helped Eisenhower and Americans decide you can't go in there. The 6,000 troops. So we overpowered them with Normandy to the south of there a little bit. You just think that was an example for the Americans said, You better not go in there uh, with uh, a few amount of troops. And that was a great example for us to build up such a big army to invade uh, in Normandy, which was the biggest amphibious invasion in South Okinawa. Um, and also, he brought up that they helped us over in, over in uh, Vietnam. They actually helped uh, with some of the uh, first Gulf War. Yeah, I'm Brian Bradley. Uh, do you have any information that they help in the uh, Operation Market Garden uh, campaign? Oh, yes. That was, that, that was in, in Holland, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. they were involved. I'm not sure that they were all the paratroopers, but um, they were involved too, yes. Um, any other questions here? Yes. No, 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 any other questions? Okay, uh, Canada's our, 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 our big sister up above, but you've heard about 40,000 people go up there to escape the Vietnam draft. Yeah. I've known several people that have done that, and, and they lived there for a long time, and I think we gave them uh, amnesty on that. I think so. One year we gave them amnesty, yeah. and they can come back here. But they didn't get amnesty very soon. We had to sit up there or go some other places for a long period of time. It was pretty tough on those. Uh, deserved for 40,000 is a lot of troops that didn't want to go to Vietnam. Um, Canada also, uh, you know, a lot of oil and sand up there, and uh, if you look at them pulling that plane across, it's called a land lease. It's so important in war, the land lease wasn't even approved until I think the spring of, of 1941. So if all that was illegal, what they were doing is pulling those planes across the, across the way. But if you look at the land lease, uh, Russia lost 80% of their planes in, 19, in 1941. We made 8,000 planes, taking Great Falls, Montana, then the Fairbanks, then the Russians flew them 
all the way to Russia, East Russia. Then in East Russia, they took them apart and took them by train to the western part of Russia. They only took three B-47s. But big planes, they only had about 200 crashes out of all that. Think of the winter in Alaska. Think of the gas problems. Think of everything of transporting 8,000 planes from America to Russia to help their, their air corps. But part of that, you had to go to Canada when you went from Great Falls, Montana, all the way to, all the way up to, uh, what you call it, Fairbanks. And Fairbanks, the name's after, he's a Hoosier. Fairbanks is named after a Hoosier. Okay, any other questions here? Uh, 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 remember, we've got a new house out there soon, and, and we'll see those troops, everyone's that give us our freedom. Thank you, and thank you. Thank you.